Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our APAC uh, Innovation Summit. Uh, my name is David Turner. I'm the Director of Standards Development at the FIDO Alliance, and I'm going to give you a brief run, for, run through of what we're doing uh, in our technology um, standards development space right now. So I'm going to cover off what we're doing with authentication. Then I'm going to touch on our Internet of Things activities and then finish up talking about what we're doing in the areas of identity verification and binding. So on the authentication side, I'm just going to do a recap here of what FIDO authentication looks like. So in the traditional world, you have a username, password, the user types in, password gets stored on the, uh, on the server, server gets hacked, password gets stolen, or you have man in the middle or phishing scenarios where your credentials get stolen, all bad things. So what FIDO has introduced is the notion of an authenticator, which acts as an intermediary between the user and the relying party. And one of the key things that the authenticator does is it creates what's called a key pair, a public private key pair that is used for doing the authentication instead of, or in addition to as a second factor using username and password. And so for every time a user connects to a new service, a new key pair is created so that there's never any confusion between sites and sites can't collude to know that it's the same authenticator being used in different places. Now, in order to make sure the user's always got control, part of how uh, FIDO works is that it always requires user authentication or user um, verification in order to create those keys. So a public and private key pair can never be created for a site without some kind of human interaction. Whether it's just touching the authenticator or entering a pin or using some kind of biometric, the process always requires a human to be involved in the activity, which helps protect against a number of automated attack vectors and threats. Once those key pairs have been generated and the public key has been given to the relying party, then when the user wants to authenticate, a challenge is sent to the authenticator from the relying party. The authenticator uses its private key to sign that challenge and then sends it back. Then the relying party uses that public key to make sure that, yep, that's the right place the right private key for that user uh, and therefore they can trust the answer and the user is authenticated and that whole flow the username a <clears throat> user sorry username is still there the password doesn't have to get exchanged uh, it doesn't show up anywhere in that transaction if there's phishing or man in the middle threats taking place uh, they may get you know the, the 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 challenge or even the signed response but there's nothing that they can do about it so it's a very solid well protected system um, these specs aren't new. We've been publishing them. They've been available now for a number of years, but we recently did updates. Um, the UAF specification was updated last December to a version 1.2 with some minor improvements and, and updates to the existing uh, protocol. We updated our CTAP 2.1 specification, which coincided with the W3C's uh, WebAuthn Level 2 release uh, in June of this year. And it included um, some not major changes, but some interesting features like enterprise attestation and uh, the ability to uh, manage pin lengths and so on. Again, for enterprise type scenarios, it added support for cross origin iframe uh, authentication, which is an important uh, requirement when trying to do online payments to uh, provide a simpler, more um, friction free type of transaction. And again, along the lines of uh, enterprise management tools, there's now um, improved ability to manage the, uh, the templates and so on that are created for uh, biometrics. The great thing about all of this is that we now have just almost complete across the board support on all the major OSs, on Android, on Windows, on all the, the different Apple uh, OSs, as well as in all the major browsers in the market. So uh, there really is no reason not to be deploying WebAuthn and FIDO these days because pretty much any device you go out and buy today has the support for FIDO2 built right in. So now moving on to the Internet of Things. Uh, Internet of Things is a massive thing, has huge scale, and two of the big problems are security and uh, timed for deployment. Both of these are, are big issues and big barriers. 
uh, security. We've heard of all sorts of bad things happening with people putting default username passwords or no username passwords or um, having unreliable, um, uh, other unreliable mechanisms built in. And deployment can be a very time consuming process if it requires some kind of manual intervention every time you put in a new device. So our goal was to provide a, a model or a, a protocol that would allow manufacturers to produce a device, drop ship it to a customer, the customer turns it on, and it automatically onboards itself in a secure manner to whatever um, cloud-based or, or um, um, local on-prem uh, device management solution that you want. And that from the point of manufacture to installation, other than physically putting it where it needs to go, the idea is that there's, it's a, otherwise a zero touch model. Uh, and this improves uh, things in a couple of ways. One, again, the time to install is dramatically improved because again, anytime a human's got to take an action, it delays things, but it also means that we don't have to worry about trusting an installer to set configuration properties or to set security properties because this can all be done in an automated and trustworthy fashion. So it's very fast. The protocol was designed to be scalable from the smallest um, processors all the way up to you know full-blown uh, uh, server level devices. Uh, an important aspect too is it was designed to be independent of any management solution that's out there. So there's cloud services from all the major providers, there's other management systems that are out there. And the, the idea was that this onboarding should work regardless of whatever device management or system you have in place. And relating to that, the other part of allowing, allowing this kind of dropship model was to make sure that the manufacturers didn't have to know in advance um, what kind of system it's going to be installed in down the road. So today's model, uh, a manufacturer has to, in many cases, know in advance whether it's going to be an Amazon Cloud or Google or Honeywell system at the other end managing it, and they have to provision the device at manufacturing with special configuration capabilities and features. Um, that meant that from the manufacturer, you had to have multiple SKUs uh, for each of those systems. The um, supply chain had to stock them all the way along. And then the end customer had to know, you know, which SKU do I buy to make sure it's going to work with whatever system I've got. And then you have the problem of what if I switched from one system to another? Um, can I still use that device in that system? Do I have to go buy it back and buy a new one? Well, one of the key aspects or key benefits of the, the FDO or FIDO device on board spec is the fact that we have this ability to do what's called late binding, which allows for um, the device to not have to determine which management system it's using until the end of the deployment cycle. So the manufacturer produces one SKU, that SKU moves through the supply chain, somebody buys it, they turn it on, the um, onboarding process starts um, using uh, you know, a secure uh, protocol. And then at that point, once that secure communication is, is established, then there's a means for the management service cloud to provision the device with the appropriate tools and then integrate it into their cloud or, or um, on-prem management system. And this is a huge benefit to the supply chain because it relieves uh, a lot of the pre-configuration and, and SKU management problems that have existed in other zero trust solutions. And then lastly, um, the, uh, this is real, let's say. Uh, there's a number of reference uh, development activities going on. A key one is taking place in a group called LF Edge, which is under the uh, Linux Foundation. And it's working on something called LF SDO. FIDO spec is called F as in FIDO DO. Um, this is a legacy issue, but they've already got code up and running and um, it's available now on GitHub. They're building a reference implementation that you anyone can come and take and use and apply to um, the system that, uh, that they're building. So, as I said, we've published the specification. The first version was published in uh, March. Uh, the key benefits is the automated secure onboarding and the, uh, the late binding aspects that I described a few minutes ago. Uh, the, the spec has been very well received and uh, we actually had our first interop test just uh, last month or two months ago, I guess it was now. 
And it was actually a very successful activity. We had input from a number of different parties and vendors, both device makers as well as um, 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 platform service vendors. Uh, and as a result, we're almost complete a version 1.1 spec, which actually includes some very significant um, improvements for interoperability. So the functional aspects of the spec were, were solid, but we discovered a few, uh, a few changes we could make to, add, to actually make the deployment uh, and uh, more interoperable uh, within the ecosystem. And so that's a spec that we're hoping to have out um, first quarter of next year. In fact, they will probably have a public version, draft version available before Christmas, but then the final release version will be available um, first quarter of next year. So the last topic I want to touch on is our identity verification and binding work. And this is a, a bit different where from what we've done before, where we've had you know, user authentication and we've been having device authentication. Uh, but what we found was that there was a market gap uh, in the industry where uh, relating to the identity proofing side of things, which is necessary both for onboarding a person, registering them with an account, but also it's an important aspect of account recovery. What happens if you lose your FIDO key? What happens if you lose your device or your phone um, that has the FIDO key registered on it? How do you re-onboard somebody in a, in a secure way? And so there's a number of mechanisms that systems out there that people have already built. Um, most of them based on some kind of proof of possession model where you've got some kind of government or uh, authoritative ID, typically with a picture on it, which allows you to take a picture of the document and validate the document have the person do a selfie and then compare that selfie with the picture that's on the document. And this can be done as a way to verify that, yes, that is the, the right user. The problem is that there's no way of evaluating systems like that today to determine, is it good enough? How successful is it? How good is it determining whether, you know, uh, it, it's processing successful documents successfully at, at a sufficient level? How, how good is it at rejecting fraudulent or fake documents? There are no metrics for this out there today. And that means that it's been put on the relying parties to try and figure out what is the quality of the systems I'm looking at. If I'm looking at two or three different vendors' products. How do I evaluate them? How do I, I know uh, or compare their capabilities to determine whether or not this is the, uh, you know, this is the system that's going to meet my needs or not. So what we're looking at is not defining how the authentication process or the selfing matching should be done. What we're doing is defining a series of security requirements and testing criteria that can be used for standardized testing of these solutions, which will allow us to set a, a set of metrics for evaluating, which can then be used by relying parties and other customers to evaluate different systems to make sure they understand what's the level of performance and capability uh, a particular system has. So the first part that we've been looking at and is, is most complete is the document authentication performance metrics or um, criteria. And what we did is we looked at what are the different types of evac attack vectors and, and threats that exist when you're dealing with with documents, how can they be fraudulent? Um, we also deal with, you know, success at capture. You know, there's issues with light and angle and, you know, is the, is the camera blurry and so on. And how do you distinguish those from fraudulent issues? And how do you find fraudulent documents when it's a blurry picture? And it's a remarkably complicated process I've been learning. Anyway, so what we're defining is the, the criteria for the evaluation, um, as well as defining metrics for things like false acceptance rate, false reject rates, and, and, and the like, uh, much like a lot of other things like biometric testing. Uh, this document has reached a review draft, draft status. It's not publicly available yet, but we have started sharing it with testing labs who are currently um, putting together proof of concept testing so that they can evaluate the test criteria to make sure that they are you know, reasonable, that, they, that the, the criteria we've set um, meet the requirements that we're looking for, um, that they work in wor real world scenarios and with real world documents. So uh, it, it, the work is essentially done, but we're now going through that testing phase, which we expect will probably provide some feedback where we'll, we'll modify the document a little bit further before releasing it. And our expectation is that 
um, we'll have both the testing program and the complete document available probably around the first quarter as well of, of next year. The second part is the face matching or the face verification aspect of this. So again, this is um, using the picture that's in the photo ID that the, the user took a picture of and then comparing that with a selfie that they would take with, with their phone or perhaps their computer, <clears throat> pardon me, and doing a comparison between the two. Uh, a lot of this is gonna be similar to existing biometric um, certification programs for, you know, for, for face recognition and face matching. Um, but there are some new wrinkles that are brought in, like you're not using a standard template. Instead, you're using the processing of a picture of a face, a picture of a picture of a face, uh, and trying to compare that. So it, it changes the, the, um, the problem a little bit and introduces a few new uh, attack vectors and, and risks. Uh, and another very important part of this is the liveness detection. Uh, you know, the whole notion of deep fakes and such has gotten so good that you've got to make sure it's a real person actually taking their picture at the time that they're taking the picture of the document, uh, which again introduces some interesting complexities and uh, uh, makes for a, a fairly challenging type of test. This work is earlier in its development. We're hoping to have it ready in the next um, month or two, let's say, in the new year. Um, and then we'll develop the testing and, and work on the POC for that uh, in the same way following the document authentication work. And lastly, um, a new topic that we're looking at is this notion of binding. So today we have means for registering an authenticator and knowing that you know it's the same authenticator the next time as it was the last time, and this time that that it's the same one and we can trust that it's the same one because it's cryptograph cryptographically bound. Similarly, we can do identity proofing and we know that David Turner, who David Turner is and, and uh, you know, we know everything about him and we believe it's him. Um, but what we don't have is a reliable standardized mechanism for binding the authenticator to David Turner so that I know that it is David Turner using that authenticator um, without having to identity proof him each and every time. And similarly, it goes the other way. If I want, if I know that it's David Turner, I want to be able to use um, his authenticator as a reliable means to perhaps uh, bootstrap another machine securely. So there's a number of, of, of uh, opportunities that exist and, and uh, higher levels of assurance you can achieve by, by connecting those two. The challenge though is how do you define that? What needs to be defined? And so we're looking at questions like, um, how do we tie the events together in a reliable way? Um, how do we bind them? Is there a cryptographic binding that, that is included now or added to the process? Um, is there metadata that needs to be created so that that metadata can be shared in a, an authorization process perhaps later that can prove that this authenticator and this user have participated in activity um, or you know, provided in a, an, even an authentication to provide a higher level of confidence? So, and as well, do we want levels of assurance? We have levels of assurance for identity proofing. We have levels of assurance for um, authentication, or authentication, pardon me. <clears throat> Perhaps we need a level of authentication for binding. These are all open questions. Um, the work is a little, it's earlier in the working group right now. They're still working on defining, um, establishing a scope and figuring out exactly what kind of document we can produce here. Uh, but it's, an, it's a topic that's of interest to everybody in the ecosystem, uh, for regardless of what kind of uh, identity, uh, or what kind of relying party, it's consumer scenarios, finance scenarios, enterprise scenarios. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a cross industry technology problem that's of interest to most of the members at FIDO. And so it's getting a lot of attention, <clears throat> pardon me, from, uh, from, from the membership. So I'm expecting we'll see some interesting things coming out of there, um, maybe second quarter of, of next year, 2022. And that's a fairly quick wrap up of where we are with the, the standards we're working on at FIDO. Uh, I didn't mention that CTAP is you know, currently looking at what's next for its work. Um, obviously, there's always a few improvements that people can make uh, to specification, but we're currently in the process of evaluating, you know, what kind of big changes or real improvements can we make? Um, and uh, 
we're going to keep working and uh, we'll keep you up to date as things evolve in the FIDO world. So I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, I appreciate your time and I hope you enjoy all of the sessions. Thank you.